good morning everybody and uh, uh, we start the uh, session today uh, as and we welcome all of you the panelists and the participants who have joined till now and uh, we have a good number of registrations so hope some others will join in the session too so uh, i welcome our panelists dr pradeep vyas uh, mr vishwajit rai choudhury Mr. Shomna Chatterjee and Imran Samad into the webinar session. A hearty welcome from Nature, Environment and Wildlife Society. Uh, and uh, we are on the last day of the Wildlife Week, celebrating the Wildlife Week in India from 2nd October to 8th October. And it is a privilege to have you all in our uh, forum here. And, um, and uh, we also, uh, you have seen that the uh, topic today is a very, very uh, uh, important topic that we are all are uh, whoever working in the conservation field is uh, confronting every day and that's urban wildlife challenges uh, conservation challenges and uh, strategies because uh, this covid situation we have seen elephants walking into the cities uh, and there were a lot of less movements which have allowed many wildlife movements again to be happening around us but then again, when the lockdown is taking away and uh, there are a lot of conflict situations also reporting, which are moving around the WhatsApp, social media, snakes here, uh, monitor lizards here and there. And we all have wetlands, water bodies, the rivers all along our cities. So all these are uh, having some problems. We are facing a lot of conflicts. So in this case, what should be the conservation uh, what are the conservation challenges and what should be the strategies is what is what we want to hear from our uh, respected panelists and i would request all the participants that uh, you may post your questions in the chat box and we will definitely try to uh, uh, get an answer from the panelists who will be here with a lot of experience for over years uh, in the field in administration in forest management, in wildlife management, and also a young researcher because they are the future of the, our country, our generations will take the thing forward. And I will not like to take much of your time, but let's hear from our panelists. And we first uh, have with us Dr. Pradeep Vyas, who is the keynote speaker here, and uh, we welcome you, sir. And there is, I think, whoever here doesn't uh, need his introduction, but still, he is an IFS who was uh, retired a few years back, and he was the former Chief Wildlife Warden of Government of West Bengal, has uh, taken a lot of wildlife, uh, has um, uh, taken the, the responsibilities of wildlife management in very many landscapes with, uh, with a lot of... Uh, flying colors and we look forward to hear from his experiences uh, uh, in all these sectors. Sir, on to you. Sir, if you can unmute yourself. Okay, how I think everyone can hear me. So first of all, thanks Lord Ajanta. And uh, I first uh, thank you for organizing this webinar on a very pertinent topic, urban wildlife conservation and challenges, con conservation challenges and strategies. So this is, I, I must say, this is uh, one of the most or biggest crisis of this time these days because many other issues merges it. Because what is... Urban today was perhaps few decades back, it was rural. And uh, a new term has come up, that is Rurban, R-U-R-B-A-N. So this is also a stage in between urban and rural. So this is a dynamic process. What is urban today was urban a decade back or two decades back and was rural long back. So what are the challenges for conservation in the urban areas? First, we have to realize the fact that as long as any wildlife 
if it is not harming human beings it adjust and it coexist with the human needs problem comes when humans realize that by any means it can be dangerous to their life or property or it may create a fear psychosis in any way then <clears throat> starts the challenges then urbanization itself is a challenge to the habitat and the behavior of the wildlife which exist in the area when i say wildlife in urban area i i, I will say ki it may not be perhaps a correct word here because wildlife what we know is as per the definition of wildlife protection act 1972 but this uh, this um, life form of biodiversity they were there even 100 years back in uh, at the time calcutta now kolkata or in bombay or in delhi so they were coexisting and in 72 when wildlife protection act was passed some of the species they got the designation of wildlife as per the schedules so we have to think that in a broader perspective when we say urban wildlife in my opinion it includes all living forms except the domesticated ones so we have to find out how these relationships of these different life forms it works with the human beings as i mentioned if the this uh, wildlife is uh, helping any way to the humans it has a bright future those life forms also those wildlife also which do not harm but they do not benefit also humans don't mind for example we have we have many many such creatures for example if we see the ducks in salt lake and where i stay in many other the area is full the rock pigeons nobody minds other people see them as a symbol of peace so people don't mind but when these rock pigeons they starting nesting right within your building and with their excreta they create lot of problems then still i will say people have tolerance that they do not kill them they put some net in the house where i live just the house adjoining to me uh, I, i saw in front of my eyes that they created a iron mesh type uh, type of structures because they felt they were fine as long as these rock pigeons they were uh, in and around but when few hundred pigeons every day started uh sleeping within their building premises and the it become a hygiene problem then they create this so in short i will say that it is the relation which defines the future of the wildlife in the urban area if it is there there are some life forms what we call as the synanthropic means that these life forms has developed these animals has developed a instinct or a behavioral change where they benefit from humans presence for example if we see within the town of within the metro of kolkata itself we can see the crows we 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 see that uh, because lot of uh, waste material which is generated these crows house crows they they thrive on that that's our population in some of the areas is quite huge uh, this uh, but in some other areas within the kolkata town itself within the town itself you will not find crows because of the availability of this food for them so this synanthropic relationship of some of the species which has been developed by those species this helps some species to thrive and some species do not thrive but the problem is that what about those species which either go for conflict with the human beings or people perceive a threat from them for example snakes in all urban areas where urbanization is going on very fast 
old bungalow type of houses they are getting converted in the housing societies multiple story flats so all trees which were there they were the house or habitat for many of the uh, urban wildlife or urban life forms within the city for example we see you know, this civet uh, cats snakes and many other such species mongoose and uh, so the moment this development work starts there these wildlife staying there so all of a sudden find they have no house to stay and then starts the conflict because they try to find out some new areas where they can settle down they go to other trees uh, out that out of that complex which is under developed for this uh, uh, housing purpose so then people see this uh, conflict for example snakes even all those who know what is the difference between a a poisonous and non poisonous snake the moment they saw snake they perceive the threat and they call the they call the wildlife rescue squads and because none of them want to take any risk of any time snakes are very good as long as they are in the fields they are helping the farmers but the moment you find them in the house is there anyone who will say yeah, i welcome it in the house itself i think rarity there may be some rarity because many people in the time of social media they have taken this snake capture also as a, a, a this photo opportunity and uh, so the call comes people do not tolerate snakes which up to some extent right also i will say up to great extent i will agree with the people ki no one will like to take risk to the life and these snakes are captured they are rehabilitated and lot of new bodies has come up who specialize themselves they are self declared specialists and they go for capture many records has also developed in various parts of the state uh, or i will say ki in every part of the country where in the name of rescuing snakes people capture snakes extract the venom sell them illegally when i was chief wild warden many this uh, local such bodies they approached me that they want a license from forest department that they should be authorized to capture and help the people and to keep the snakes so catch was here only number one the moment you allow someone you have to take them and in spite of there are risk there are many instances where they have been bitten and uh, some people have lost their life also and many stories or many complaint comes that the snake has this uh, venom extraction is going on and this has become a threat there where the snakes uh, venom is being extracted and is being smuggled out of the country to the bangladesh then to the other parts in the uh, this is southeast countries uh, for various purposes so these are also the challenges that if you have to help then uh, how to cope with these type of problems also but i will say the maximum attention which is drawn as a urban wildlife which is conflict are the monkeys langurs civet the uh, snakes and civets i have already mentioned snake these civets are innocent but their look itself gives fear to the people people those who do not have idea how dangerous or how innocent these creatures can be they get horrified by their presence it looks dangerous so they ring them and this is a large number of civets snakes and all this capture going on most most of the areas then mongoose which all of us know is almost harmless there are many cases when people have called that they want this uh, some strange type of looking animals they come to their gardens within the calcutta within the kolkata town itself and when they send the pictures and when even then they are told that they are harmless rather they can help them the snakes will avoid those areas but in spite of that they do not want to take the risk so in short i will say one can be the lack of awareness then there can be perceived threat for the urban wildlife which is there 
the process of urbanization which is uh, shrinking the habitat urban habitat uh, urban habitat uh, uh, there so this conservation challenges becomes difficult and then of course i don't know whether you call the leopards which are reaching to mumbai town uh, this uh, from the borivali national park and we call them urban wildlife or we have included in the forest so they are still the forest wildlife so urbanization has gone to that level that urbanization has encroached in the forest forest so i will not call them the urban wildlife they are trying to coexist but their behavior is changing that they have started depending on the humans as far as food is there so this change in the behavior is ensuring that in spite of the uh, best efforts they will not remain inside the forest they will go for dogs goats and other such type of smaller animals which are available domesticated animals which are available especially pigs also which are available in the urban areas so this threat is there and overall this issue issue is uh, becoming a real challenge now because uh, my time is in coming near to that i will just mention some of the some of the, the these uh, issues ki how we can do it first of all i will say ki we have to we we have to go for massive awareness campaigns which are going on but still they are not enough the awareness campaign will not help that people will tolerate this wildlife easily but it will certainly help that these wildlife or these life forms they will not be killed by the people the other people will approach to the forest department for the rescue and rehabilitation so this awareness is a must and it cannot be for moment alone everybody has to win and this is one of the area i will say the ngos are playing and they can play a major role in future to come to save this urban wildlife then rehabilitation program this forest department has to play a major role and often i have i have seen that uh, to save forest and to save uh, man this so many other uh, aspects uh, which are related to it often these life forms they are rescued and whichever is the nearest forest whether it is small or not they are most of the wildlife says they are taken there and released and frankly speaking there is no monitoring because there are not enough manpower and funds to monitor what is happening to such wildlife which was habituated to the urban life here and how this behaves if they are taken to the urban type of areas and um, so that, that's also very important when i say rehabilitation means not the capture and release this also includes some monitoring and find out what is happening whether the area is exactly suitable or just simply releasing i feel it does not simply dissolve me from my responsibility if my problem has been solved but i have to solve the problem in such a way that the wildlife wherever it is relocated it thrives there it enjoys the area rather than facing the problems and target rural areas i, I will say ki from now on what this again i will address to the really to the ngos because uh, forest department has a very limited resources that uh, what is happening in major urban areas that's fine but from now itself efforts should be made in the urban areas that is uh, which are slightly or the urban conglomerates or slightly rural in nature or even near to that which are now rural there are a lot of wildlife in these different forms is there and people have no idea that someone can be to capture it there is no no means to go there for the even forest department because they have the, they lack the resources so these areas awareness should be done right now so that they do not disappear fast this wildlife from these areas do not disappear fast we should not wait that after two decades when urbanization will be there then we will start our efforts there so yes you put maximum efforts in the urban areas you have to relocate 
but side by side urban areas and rural areas also you have to focus so that you have what is going to happen in next 20 years we we target those in increasing awareness awareness mode uh, awareness modes then we have a body in the west bengal itself in that is there in other in every state in every state this is known as the rera and in our state it is known as the hira that is housing infrastructure regulating authority this these are the authorities which makes rules for all the housing projects which are coming up uh, especially they are mainly focusing now on the this afforestation uh, programs then there are different complaints by the builders and all that or say purchasers and all that so i think there is no harm the contacting uh, this uh, chairman uh, hira that uh, there should be some clauses related to that in the guidelines related to urban wildlife so the moment a developer starts plan for one of the area which has now a lot of trees and all that apart from trees giving recommendation or giving money for the afforestation program that they should also focus that these are the wildlife areas and we will bear the cost for this their relocation and forest department chip in especially i will mention that the current chairman of ira in west bengal is a for ex forest officer the dr sandeepan mukherjee he retired as a additional pccf from the uh, just a year back so he can be of great help to save this uh, uh, this uh, right um, this uh, urban wildlife and my last point is that has anybody tried formal or informal estimation or census or guesstimation of what are the different urban life forms in different parts of the state how much conflict is going on this is not a that difficult job because conflict data are available in the forest department so that instead of doing fire fight measures within the forest department key there's a this uh, 24 hour helpline that people rush there and they do it so if a you can say preemptive mode is there or say i will say key reaction it can be pre action also that these are the areas which has the water bodies and other still some wildlife is striking there so what can be done the discussions can be there and with the locals and others and uh, the special micro plans can be developed for such areas within the urban areas for example i will say calcutta this wetland so in these areas more urban wildlife is so there can be micro plan which is involving local communities involving ngos and all so all these ample opportunities are there where all the stakeholders can be involved but before i end i will say only one thing this urban wildlife those species who are perceived threat or as a conflict their existence in urban a is in is in real threat and uh, i think all those people who are aware or who directly or indirectly associated with it they should come forward chip in to this cause of conversation thank you very much so ajanta i i stop it here okay thank you sir very much it was really a very uh, interesting discussion because you stressed on the relationships of the various uh, components of uh, the urban ecosystem as we perceive it and then you also said on the urban development norms and uh, how we can really the as uh, people of the um, urban uh, areas can really contribute into making their urban spaces more friendly to wildlife and others uh, and other such um, uh, uh, species and also you talked about the rescue the risks associated and uh, uh, the challenges that the forest department faces and mostly important i found sir the conservation stewardship model that you stressed upon on the micro plan related to uh, certain uh, ecosystems where they are found in a large number so thank you sir very much and uh, we have a question for from uh dr dhubodhuti chakraborty but i would like to take it uh, later on 
uh, after the uh, panel discussion is over, uh, after the uh, session is over, uh, the, all the speakers have rendered their speeches and we'll definitely put it to uh, Dr. Vyas. And uh, uh, sir, now, now uh, can we have a talk from you, sir, Vishwajit Rai Chaudhuri? And I think uh, he is the member of the State Wildlife Advisory Board for the longest time, I think from 2003. Uh, he is there and uh, is a veteran wildlifer and also the secretary of Nature, Environment and Wildlife Society. Has a lot of accolades to his names. And sir, we want to hear, you, uh, hear from you about uh, the topic today. Thank you, sir. Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, I will just... Uh... Uh, add a few uh, points on what uh, Dr. Grass uh, said. Uh, actually, he described the entire thing. So <laughs> nothing is left for anybody. So anyway, uh, occurrence of wildlife in Kolkata uh, has increased significantly, uh, especially in South Calcutta in last 10 years. Every day, at least I get uh, eight to 10 calls, telephone calls uh, for rescue of animals. Animals that includes seabeds, mongoose, monitors, and uh, even snakes like cobra, Russell's viper, and, but mostly uh, rat snake and uh, uh, wolf snake. So, but people, when, when they first see a snake, what uh, Dr. Vass said just now, they don't, uh, uh, they first, in first uh, look, they uh, assess it as a very venomous snake. It's a very dangerous snake. So they can start to create panicking and the people from neighborhood comes and kill it or we, we get it, uh, uh, and some in some other cases I've seen, I get calls, most of the cases, where a kite has uh, broken its wing, a crow is uh, hanging in a electric uh, wear, and uh, so on. Uh, there are many others also. So this is happening to, happening for uh, this, uh, multi-story, uh, this big, big uh, palace like Kolkata was known uh, as a city of palaces. And there were many pal palatial buildings in Calcutta, Calcutta with big orchards and trees uh, where these, these animals used to reside. And in my, where I stay in Bhavanipur, uh, there are also uh, quite uh, a few uh, big old properties like you have seen, must have seen this, uh, uh, that big shopping, I forgot the name. Anyway, uh, <clears throat> that has come out, come up with, a, uh, with a <clears throat> removing a big chunk of uh, wildlife habitat. And uh, so where will these animals go? They, they come inside other uh, households, they uh, come uh, on the road. Sometimes I, I found in, in Gokhan Road, uh, civets are being uh, 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 killed by tigers. I, I, I saw, sorry, I, I mean, uh, cards, motor, running motor cards. So uh, this, is, uh, this is becoming very common incident in Kolkata. In many cases I have seen Mongoose are also killed uh, in uh, uh, Bali Ganj area. Uh, I have seen that. So, uh, I was in a committee uh, sometimes back uh, in Pollution Control Board, where uh, any any building, uh, any uh, construction, more than uh, ten crores. Uh, they, they, they had to take permission from this committee. And this was a five-man committee. And where I have seen that the promoters come with a, a presentation, PowerPoint presentation, 
which looks like a very, very sunny thing. You know, it is uh, everywhere there is green, everywhere there is, uh, you will, there are water bodies. And so <clears throat> uh, with that, you can't assess what is happening uh, actually. Uh, what, what will take, ultimately what will happen when the, the construction will be finished. <clears throat> so, uh, I don't know whether this sort of uh, committees, uh, how much uh, uh, they, can, they can help to save this wildlife, but uh, there should be a very, very strict rule that every housing complex, every housing, uh, new housing complex which are coming, coming up, should have adequate number of trees, adequate greeneries where these animals can uh, take their shelter. We uh, worked for a project uh, in Calcutta Airport where um, uh, there were problem of jackals and uh, 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 jackals sometimes used to stand uh, in the middle of the runway and that uh, posed threat for uh, the aircrafts. So uh, airport, we got the project from the airport authority uh, uh, and uh, there in a year we have, we have uh, captured more than 82 jackals and three jungle cats and those were handed over to the forest department and uh, forest department, they take, when they go uh, for release, they go to the proper area, forested area and release it. And uh, same thing is happening with, around the periphery of Tolly Club. Uh, like the jackals in Tolly Club, they are safe, they are fine. And, uh, but when they come out in the night, into, in the garbage places, they're this, they, they, they create a menace. And uh, uh, they carry rabies and uh, they fight with the stray dogs and uh, so uh, these things has to be has to be stopped immediately for safety of uh, Calcutans. On the other hand, uh, instead of uh, killing the snakes or uh, uh, killing the civets, civet has a bad habit that uh, though it is a it eats fruits, uh, it, it kills other uh, uh, birds like uh, poultry birds and uh, pet birds, they kill it. So people, they, they have a stigma for that. And so they don't like, uh, and the appearance of civet is quite, uh, uh, quite fearful. So the people who doesn't know, uh, uh, who haven't seen civet, but heard the name of civet, that civet create this menace. And uh, they, 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 when they see civet, they become panicked and called. So I think uh, there should be, uh, uh, there, there, once upon a time, there uh, a, a, a rescue line of uh, forest department was uh, created, uh, one number was created, but I think it is not functioning now. Now we want a 24 hours uh, rescue uh, uh, line so that whenever we get any complaint from any anywhere, any uh, anybody, any animal has gone inside their premises, we can immediately give them the number or we can call the for that uh, on that hotline to the forest department so that it can be rescued uh, safely and uh, the other thing is people uh, people of kolkata we usually with the uh, ngos we work who work for environment and wildlife uh, especially wildlife we work in the rural areas and uh, very few NGOs are there who work in Kolkata. So I think NGOs should be made uh, aware about these facts and uh, uh, more awareness 
should be done by them uh, in Kolkata in different clubs, in different paras, different puja committees uh, regarding uh, uh, the importance of these animals and not instead of killing or uh, panicking, uh, they should take it uh, easily and uh, uh, they will contact the forest department. And uh, what Dr. Vass pointed out, that is also a very important point. Nowadays, there is a habit of many young chaps uh, to handle snakes. They uh, handle snakes without any training. They just uh, uh, practice some uh, catching the snakes and uh, they think themselves as uh, snake experts or a herpetologist. And uh, uh, this, is, this is a dangerous practice, I think. Uh, uh, the, uh, because uh, in many cases, very poisonous snakes are there. And they, if they, uh, uh, if they uh, try to catch it, they can, that, that, that can cause a, a fatal accident. So forest department, they have snake catchers they have rescuers everything is with them but we need what i think we need a 24-hour helpline hotline uh, where we can connect the people or we can connect when we get whenever we get any telephone call we can connect them that's all thank you Thank you, Mr. Rai Choudhury. Yes, you raised uh, the concerns as uh, citizens of Kolkata as to what is disturbing you and what the Kolkatans and also the NGO practitioners should do uh, and also the need for a 24-hour uh, hotline. I think that exists now in many, um, in many capacities it exists, but uh, we also understand that the forest department's uh, it's almost like a firefighting <clears throat> thing because uh, there are so many calls and we don't have, uh, uh, the, there are staff problems, etc. And how really we uh, can help this to uh, take it forward with all the concerns that we have to have a belt. I think there should be a belt around the forest department where also some other uh, questions, some other uh, these rescues can be handled and how really we can take it forward. Uh, we would like to hear from uh, Mr. Yes, sir. Just, just your one point. Uh, yes, I just now check the helpline because mm -hmm. I remember this issue was very important and that's why we started a number when I was chief board warden that there should be a dedicated line. And uh, when uh, maybe at times uh, it not be, might not be functioning, but right now I called and uh, I, I found that others can also try uh, this and uh, people can note down the number also, 1800 This is working 24 hour by seven. And because eight, many zero, people zero. have been kept there to attend because staff is very short. So maybe one person is there if he has gone for toilet and all that, we don't have two persons or three persons there. So I think still the same issue is going on, but this number exists there. I'm repeating it again, 1-800-345-5204. Thank you, thank you, Ajit. Thanks, sir, uh, for thank your you. uh, intervention. And uh, yes, uh, we have taken a note of it. And um, I think now let's uh, hear to uh, Mr. Shomnath Chatterjee. He is the Assistant Wildlife Warden of uh, Wildlife uh, Wing and is positioned in headquarters and is the receiver of all such calls and handling uh, the wildlife rescue management with whatever resources he has. And, uh, and, and let's look forward to hear from him. Sir, uh, Mr. Chatterjee, to you for your presentation. Yes. Uh, good morning to everyone and my respect to uh, respected Dr. Vyas sir. Uh, he was my ex-boss and I have learned lots of things, lots of handling of wildlife, etc. from him. It is a privilege to me to share the same platform uh, with him. 
and also thanks to others also uh, especially miss day and uh, mr vishwajit rajaguri to uh, give me the opportunity to say something about the work we are doing uh, regarding uh, rescue of wildlife as well as uh, uh, caesar of wildlife all in the urban areas uh, actually i am going to give a powerpoint presentation to show our works and uh, the mm, discussion i heard from the dr bhaskar and mr vishwajit raj choudhury all are very pertinent to this subject and we all are trying uh, our best so that the wildlife we are uh, living with our neighbors they can be safely uh, stay with us and we can become good neighbors uh, so let me start my powerpoint presentation we can see it please continue okay <clears throat> i will uh, do it in two parts the first part will be the the wildlife uh, we are having in and around us in the urban area and the second part uh, the caesar uh, the capture of uh, wildlife live or parts that we are doing in the wildlife effort uh, the generally we have these wildlife in our neighborhood the civet snakes mongoose squirrels jackal common lengu resus meca water monitor lizard and uh, to some extent jungle cat and fishing cat also nowadays uh, toke gecko has also become a very popular uh, animal now and birds also first the civets uh, this is the common palm civet uh, we uh, we receive lots of lots and lots of complain of uh, rescuing this animal uh, commonly known as bham uh, in bengali this is a scheduled to part 2 uh, animal and uh, I, i have to mention that uh, this animal enjoys the same status as tiger elephant all uh, enjoys it is a very endangered and very much uh, protected species we have another civet in our locality which is a small indian civet in bengali it is called gondogopul though it is very rare nowadays Uh, but it uh, once it used to uh, exist in our uh, locality but now has become very much rare a very sweet scent comes out of its uh, skin that's why it is called gandhogopul in bengali now we come to snakes uh, the common snakes the common venomous snakes which we uh, confront uh, almost every day uh, in our uh, uh, helpline numbers these are mainly monoclet cobra spectacle cobra and russell's viper the cobras and vipers both uh, all are uh, scheduled to part two animals that is uh, protected under wildlife protection act actually the uh, mainly they move they are nocturnal they move during the night and uh, if we tell about their feeding they mainly uh, feed on the rodents uh, the mice rats etc Uh, actually they are doing uh, they are, they can uh, be uh, said as some type of scavengers also now we come to the common non venomous snakes the most non uh, common non venomous snake uh, come across is rat snake in bengali it is called darash people are very much scared about it because it is a law it is a very long uh, big snake though it has no venom in it and people just get scared of its uh, look it is uh, it looks really scary but it does not have any uh, venom the other uh, common uh, non venomous snake is shekal kill bear jaldhora the common water snake uh, it uh, stays in water only in the drains etc now two other snakes uh, which we come across uh, very often uh, one is venomous and another is non venomous these are common crate and wolf snake uh, people uh, confuse very much in between these uh, two snakes because because it uh, those uh, these two snakes look very much familiar though common crate uh, in bengali is uh, it is a very uh, venomous snake and wolf snake is completely non venomous snake but in our uh, kolkata and surroundings uh, we rarely found this common crate common crate is 
mostly found in suburban areas uh, and it is uh, really dangerous uh, if anyone gets its bites uh, he has to be taken within an hour uh, to the hospitals to get the antivenom snake so we have to be very aware of these two snakes uh, because wolf snake cannot be confused with uh, common threat now i am i want to show you one uh, video where uh, one of our rescuers is rescuing a spectacled cobra which is entangled in a fishing net we got this call from a uh, suburban areas near taliganj our team arrived there see the snake has been entangled in a in a trap sir we are not able to see the uh, video okay okay I, th I think you may uh, upload it again and try once more. can you see now yes we can see now yes uh, sorry for the inconvenience uh, now uh, we can see that uh, one spectacled cobra has been entangled in a fishing a fishing net uh, we got the got a call on our toll free number our team arrived there it is uh, it was near uh, the taliganj area and uh, our colleagues are rescuing the snake from the net i'm just showing these videos to show in which conditions in which situations our team is working we are very short in number but we are not in short in our effort see the snake is being rescued it is a big spectacled cobra it will be taken in this uh, snake box and taken to our wildlife uh, wild animal rescue center and thereafter we will release the snake in the habitat the other animals uh, that we get uh, in our locality in our neighborhood are uh, these gray mongoose uh, sir has uh, told in details about these animals this is also a scheduled to part 2 animal that means very much protected it is very harmless uh, it stays on its own uh, but we don't know how we are getting afraid of these animals and we also get called on these uh, farm squirrel also this is also a schedule 4 animal of wildlife protection act this is also a protected animal but often we get calls and uh, there are accident case also death case also now indian jackal uh, uh, mr aishudri has also told about this animal uh, jackal is uh, can be told as the main scavenger uh, it is found in airport area it is found in taliganj we also found it in the belgachia uh, veterinary hospital area in many numbers they are harmless but people get scared of their uh, call only we went to the uh, 
uh, locality where we got the complaint of uh, jackal in the bilgachi area the people told that uh, they are doing nothing else but only their call is uh, that they are disturbing the uh, with their, their call and uh, we just had to persuade them we had just to told them that they are our good neighbors let them stay there they are good scavengers and just uh, turn your deaf ear uh, to the calls and nothing could be done about this animal common uh, lengur and uh, rhesus macaque these are the two animals which we uh, for which we get so much of calls in our uh, rescue center uh, mostly the lengurs uh, common lengurs uh, make some menace in the howrah areas hugli areas uh, we have to capture them and otherwise uh, most of them are electrocuted they uh, they are run over by uh, vehicles and we get them in the half death uh, situation we have to treat them and most of the cases we get success in uh, making them fit and again we free them in their habitat and the same happens in case of rhesus macaque also uh, we we get most of the cases uh, of rhesus macaque from uh, badwipur diamond harbor that is uh, just outskirts of uh, kolkata the same case happens there uh, they get run over they get ele- electrocuted uh, people uh, throw uh, stones to them uh, if they come to the uh, uh, so just uh, disturb this is just a result of disturbing these animals which are mostly harmless water monitor lizard we get also calls uh, for rescuing of water monitor lizard they are also very harmless they are also uh, very much highly protected in the, in the wildlife uh, protection act but people get scared of their looks they look uh, they, stay, they say that they, this looks like dragon they are uh, children are scared so people call us we have to capture them and uh, again have to rehabilitate them to the other habitats jungle cat and fishing cat we also are getting these uh, animals call uh, of rescuing uh, jungle cat is often found in the airport area and also in the suburban areas uh, like uh, um, uh, bojerhat diamond harbor baripur from here uh, we get the calls of rescuing jungle cat they are also being run over uh, in the, we had a we had an incidents in newton newtown area where a jungle cat was ra- run over by vehicles in the night and the same happens in ca- in the case of fishing cat also i have to uh, i have it is worth mentioning that these two animals are very very highly protected fishing cat is our state animal and jungle cat is also scheduled to part two animal so we have to be very careful about these animals and now toke gecko this is the most this is now one of the most traded wildlife uh, previously toke gecko was not included in the wildlife protection act but in last 6 5 6 uh, 7 years the trade of these wildlife has uh, uh, become very very uh, high uh, don't know where from where these rumors has come that uh, from these toke gecko uh, high value medicines are made Uh, it is mainly uh, coming from these uh, these rumors are mainly coming from southeast asia china and uh, people are catching these uh, so harmless so silent animal and trading them so depending on these issues uh, wildlife protection uh, they are they have been included in the wildlife protection act and now they are protected in the schedule 4 of wildlife protection act uh injuries uh, in kolkata is uh, happening to these uh, black kite they are the most uh, commonly available uh, predator uh, species in our locality or in any uh, urban areas but black kite is being very much uh, thrown to our uh, electrocution the matters or uh, kites uh, we are uh, that we fly during festivals the wings of the kites are being uh, damaged and we get calls from 
every parts of the city almost every day that one kite has been damaged has been uh, injured due to flying of a uh, string of flying kites and we have to rescue them we take them to our uh, wildlife animal, animal rescue center and uh, there are cases that uh, many kites are there many birds are there which uh, have become the beyond uh, 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 fit that means we have to keep them in our uh, enclosure months after months and their wings are not getting well so much damage are done by these uh, streams and also electrocution now i share you one data of uh, wildlife rescued in and around kolkata since 2016 17 i i am showing you the data you see that uh, almost every year we are rescuing in and around kolkata from 5000 to 5500 animals and all the animals including birds snakes turtles monitor lizards all are highly protected in wildlife protection act we should be very much uh, proud that we are sharing our neighborhood with such highly valued animals these are some uh, birds which have been uh, found which have been rescued these are two kites which were damaged by electrocution and the string of flying kites other birds that are get injured getting injury open bill stock barn owl barn owl owl is the second most uh, bird uh, which gets most of the injuries and they are getting abandoned to this is a common palm civet which we are being uh, rescued see how big the, the civet is the mother it is lying above and we rescued its four to five juveniles also i am showing you one complaint that we receive uh, very frequently one of the sample is here uh for security and safety of the complainant i have not uh, mentioned his her name see what has he written or uh, she written dear sirs there have been a lot of civet cats in bracket farm in our neighborhood for many months now we have been trying to live in amity with them unfortunately they have gotten quite bold and are constantly seen on our window sills and verandas at night in their attempts to enter the house leaving their fecus behind as evidence and of course they perform a tandav on our terrace each night judging by the sounds as a result we have been forced to sleep with all our windows shut not very healthy for us ours is a four story building with a large krishna chuda practically touching it our downstairs neighbors and the building next door to have been subjected to bomb invasions kindly help us by trapping these creatures and returning them to the forest there are quite few of them i believe thank you so these type of uh, letters these type of calls emails we get every day 10 to 15 we get uh, mainly for civets uh, we give them cage we put cage there uh, leave the the cages for 5 to 10 days and after 5 to 10 days we get the call from those persons they say that uh, the civets have been trapped and we again uh, get the, the cages back from them and after 5 or 10 days or one month again same complaint is uh, given by the same person and again we do the same thing so this cycle is going well, uh, just in cycling cycle way now i am showing you Uh, another video where a monitor lizard is being uh, rescued from a very congested area a uh, slum area of kolkata please tell me whether you are able to see the video it is running can you see it yes we can see it okay see uh, one juvenile monitor lizard was uh, just hiding in fear of us in a very congested slum area of belgachia 
our colleague is rescuing it and taking it out see how congested the place is and see the shouting and the land the shouting that the people is making this is a small one there are police to handle the crowd our persons our colleagues are getting it inside the cage monitor lizard this is being rescued and we will take it to our wildlife animal rescue center and again we will release it in the habitat now this is the and this is another data of wildlife rescued in west bengal since 2016 17 i am showing you this data here we uh, can have the uh, data of uh, rural areas also because it is uh, the data of total west bengal see here also on an average we are rescuing 10000 to 15000 animals per year these animals often get outside of the forest and they are unable to get back to their habitat we rescue them save them and save the people also from getting harm and again release them in the jungle now i am showing you a very uh, meaningful video where a common langur is being rescued from the bidhanagar railway overbridge see how difficult the situation is sorry the video quality is very poor one common langur is running on the overbridge we are trying to rescue it it is very much injured five to six people are trying to rescue it trying to trap it and at last they could able to trap it inside the net so this is the way this is the situation in which our colleagues are operating our colleagues are rescuing the animals and i can say saving the common people also from getting hurt of these animals these are some of the other animals we have we had rescued uh, see one vulture one python and one jackal this was from the the airport area these are juveniles of the jackals the rhesus macaques jungle cat fishing cat now i show you how our staffs our colleagues treat and care the injured animals in our wildlife animal rescue center i am basically telling about the our kolkata center the salt lake center where we have the uh, facility to treat one common langur was grievously injured by a road accident he is given treatment every day by our colleagues by our staffs the animal is also cooperating with us we can see it we have a veterinary surgeon also here in solik center but uh, these regular works are being done by our staffs they have get trained and they have got used to in doing these treatments
this was the uh, rescue part now i turn to our uh, rescue of wildlife from illegal wildlife trade you i think you know that uh, kolkata has become a very uh, hot spot a good hot spot for wildlife trade for last 5 or 6 years and we have been rescuing we have been seizing lots of animals which are uh, very rare in these areas and which are being traded through, through our city this is a small data of the wildlife offense in and around kolkata this is mainly of our wildlife headquarter in kolkata which we are uh, doing uh, at present here see in the last 5 years we have rescued so much of animals which were being traded through our dear city and each year we arrest nearly 30 to 40 people every uh, year for in, uh, for getting engaged in this wildlife trade they are being prosecuted they are under trial the strategy if you can make it a little faster thank you okay okay this is uh, some pictures of uh, rescued scheduled birds this is uh, uh, you know the gallery street pet market in every sunday we do this uh, vigilance duty we do this awareness campaigns also this was the biggest seizure of mongoose hair brush in kolkata around 33000 of uh, mongoose hair brush was seized we were assisted by wildlife crime, crime control bureau actually we have to deal uh, in a wildlife headquarter both the uh, vigilance work as well as the rescue work we have two uh, cells one is for the rescue work and the other one is for the uh, vigilance work mm, though it uh, during the lockdown the, in the last 6 or 7 months uh, the wildlife trade in kolkata has been reduced to a good extent this was our caesar of sea cucumbers another schedule one animal uh, actually this was uh, first intercepted by the customs of domnam uh, uh, airport and then we seized and arrested these persons see these four persons all are very ed educated english speaking per persons they were taking these animals dead animals of course uh, to thailand this was a very good consignment of indian shop shell turtle which were uh, seized from dhulagar toll plaza this was a snake venom we arrest uh, uh, seized basel was telling uh, telling about it uh, snake venom has been a very lucrative business nowadays this is the le leopard skin which we seized from shambajar area in kolkata Deer, four deer skins we seized from Babuhat bus stand, and this was the lion cub. You must have uh, learned about it. We seized, we we arrested five persons, and these lion cub uh, were rescued from the Belgashia Expressway. This was uh, the very rare spotted black terrapin. This was also been traded from uh, Gorya area. We. sees live pangolins also rescued them toke gecko i was telling about this uh, animal nowadays toke gecko is being traded with very high frequency we do the we do regular awareness work we do regular vigilance work of against illegal trade so these are the works uh, these are the things uh, we are going uh, we are making to rescue to seize animals i have an appeal on the part of uh, forest government on the part of wildlife wing to the citizens to our honorable citizens that uh, environment we are living in is really precious as we are sh sharing our surroundings with such members of this living world for whom should we should be very proud of we are only to remember that the animals we are living with all came on this world well before we arrived here they are actually our ancestors we can tell them as our ancestors uh, so we uh, do not 
possess the right to harm any of the animals surrounding us they have the very equal right to live on this world as we do we will behave like a good neighbor the rest will be taken care of by the nature itself if anyone feels unsafe due to presence of any wild animal in in or her here uh, her neighborhood instead of taking any action against the animal please take the pain to call the forest department the number has been shared by vester i am i am again reiterating it 18003455204 we are always here to save the wildlife and the environment thank you very much thank you so much for this wonderful presentation i think everyone enjoyed it and understood the various challenges that you are facing and we really salute you in whatever capacities you are trying to do your best to address the challenges but uh, we all understand that it is not alone the uh, responsibility of the forest department only but we all this uh, conscious citizens whoever working has to come forward and act uh, in whatever capacities they have and um, we are we re are really en enlightened by all the uh, work that is happening and uh, and it it is obvious that urban wildlife in in urban centers are also uh, the centers for trade the wildlife trade so that also is a very very important part which we have to take care of now now if we go on to the next speaker our youngest one uh, still in the college level <laughs> mr imran samad and uh, he happens to be a student and researcher with the national center for biological sciences in bangalore and uh, he is particularly uh, fanatic i would say passionate about cetaceans working on marine biodiversity and also he did his masters thesis on the freshwater river dolphins in the parakka so we all have wetlands rivers around all cities and we would like to hear from him what he has to say to us in order to take the conservation challenges forward over to imran the floor is yours now thanks ajit sir uh, and a very good afternoon to everyone uh, today I'm going to talk about a small part of the research project that I did on the Kansas River Dolphin. Uh, uh, before that, I'd like to thank News for allowing me to, uh, for give, providing me this opportunity to speak uh, about my research to a large variety of audience. And News is very special to me because I began my research work through News. I was first employed there and then I eventually entered the field of research. Uh, what I'm going to talk about may uh, be reiterating a few facts that have already been very nicely spoken by the previous speakers, but I'll try to keep it as engaging, as entertaining as it has been till now. Uh, so I'd like to begin with a very simple question of what exactly is wildlife? And a very nice answer was given by Dr. Vyas in his talk right now. Wildlife is anything that is uh, an untamed form of uh, life is uh, referred to as wildlife. So typically when we hear of wildlife, we think of continuous swatches of rainforest, we think of megafauna like elephants, and we think of unexplored wild areas where dolphins and whales occur. But that is only half the truth because there's little pristine about the world that we live in. Megafauna is something that occurs very close to people and there's little area that is unexplored in the world today. And this increase in the spatial um, spread of people, uh, it is very much linked to global urbanization. Uh, urbanization typically is defined as the increase in the proportion of people living in urban centers like cities and um, maybe around developing villages. And urbanization particularly isn't the problem. The problem is what urbanization does. And what it does is that it changes landscapes and areas in unnatural ways that uh, wouldn't have been there naturally. Uh, for example, I have a very nice study to show here uh, by Josie et al. in 2019. What they did is they uh, mapped the state of Morocco in Northern Africa and tried to see how uh, the land use has changed over time. For example, in this map, this yellow color that you see, tiny dots here, here and there, these are urban built up areas and the green is forest. But, and this is 2003. But as time passes, the forest decreases and urban areas begin to increase. 
so there's an expanse of people and even in 2017 the trend remains the same and they have projected by 2030 a lot of things will change urbanization will be spread even more vastly forest areas will decrease and agriculture land will increase and even though this study is for morocco uh, the story of india isn't really very really different and when you have a decreasing space for wildlife and an increasing space for humans what happens is that you get a greater overlap of human and wildlife and typically the species that you expect to find in uh, forests and seas you find them in places that you don't expect them to be for example this is an endangered lion-tailed macaque it is found in pockets of the southern western ghats and it is a canopy dwelling species it in the forest it is never seen on the forest floor but here you can see it um, feeding on a garbage dump then you also have leopards that people usually think of uh, occurring in forests and uh, uh, unexplored areas but here you have a leopard with the backdrop of a city and we know of all these species but there are also species that stay with us hidden the people who stay close to those species also do not know that they do exist and one such example is the ganges river dolphin uh, on which i worked in farakka and farakka uh, the ganga river flows through farakka and it is a semi urban kind of landscape and people live very close to the to the river and but except for fishermen no one really knows that such an animal exists in the rivers in fact they think that it is a huge fish dangerous to human beings which is of course not the case but calling the river dolphin an urban species is not exactly correct because uh, the relationships that human rivers and dolphins have is a little more complicated than ancient human civilizations have always thrived near rivers be it harappa mohenjo-daro or any other ancient civilization and even our cities today larger cities are built very close to rivers and river dolphins have always been in the rivers so you have this relationship uh, that is very very old in fact the first very first mention of the river dolphin was in the uh, maurya empire 250 bc uh, in the reign of uh, ashoka and it was referred to as the ganga puputaka then later it it was referred to as the Kok Abi in the 15th century, the Babur Nama. Babur had a very uh, interesting and nice profession to document and understand the uh, species and wildlife that are these instances. The species is thought to be, uh, is required to be protected and not the citizens, uh, of the, by then citizens. Uh, but since then, quite a lot of things have changed. We have changed how we look at our rivers. Our rivers are more polluted, they're more noisy, they are filled with people, and rivers are not naturally flowing. We have created dams and barrages at various, inst at various places in, along rivers, which has reduced them into controlled environments, which has never been the case uh, before humans arrived on Earth. Uh, uh, in this map, you can see the Ganges River, which is the extinct of dolphin occurrence. The, the Ganges River dolphin occurs all over the Ganga River uh, in Brahmaputra, also in Bangladesh. And you can see that the pink colors here indicate that populations of the river dolphin have been isolated because of creation of very dams and barrages, which means that the populations which are shown in pink here are not connected to populations that are already there in the blue areas. But despite all these things, you can see that a good proportion of the populations also occur very close to mega cities like Kolkata, like Dhaka, even Kanpur. Uh, so uh, is that really a good thing for dolphins? Because we have changed the environment so much and yet they are with us all this time. Uh, if it is good, then why exactly is it good? And if it is not, then why shouldn't it be good? Because what we see is that dolphins are adapting to changes, but we do not know how exactly they are adapting to the, to the ways that we are modifying our environments and rivers. And one important form of river modification and an important characteristic of an urbanizing and a developing world is channeling of river waters into areas where it is needed. 
and this is done by using uh, structures called barrages so what happens is uh, this is a map of a girija of the girija barrage in uttar pradesh so what is done is that a uh, linear structure is erected on the river to block the flow of the river and then that water is diverted through canals into places where they are needed like agricultural fields or close to cities or wherever the case may be and these uh, these canals are artificial they don't occur naturally these have been dug up by people only for the purpose of transportation of water and you can see what this does is as the water is other places the area immediately below the dam there is very little water there and uh, the total habitat for species and dolphins and otters and all kinds of species of this reduces drastically uh, but and this artificial uh, this uh, these artificial canals are not just restricted to uh, uttar pradesh in fact they are everywhere because we have built barrages on the ganga almost everywhere bangladesh tributaries of the brahmaputra tributaries of the ganga so but Uh, we don't exactly know how dolphins adapt to such modifications how do dolphins live in these uh, kind of semi urban and modernized habitats so but to understand that we must uh, we must understand a little about dolphin ecology dolphin river dolphins occur in rivers and rivers are quite complicated uh, from they start from mountains and hills and they go all the way to the sea and uh, they have Compli- uh, they have complications like meanders they merge together and they split apart and all that gives rise to uh, variation in depth all along the rivers all along the length of the river and you can see here the river is not linear so some parts are deep and some parts are shallow and dolphins have evolved to adapt uh, to live in such uh, structures and one important thing to note here is as the month as the summer season approaches and the water de- declining river dolphins used to small pockets where there is enough water and they are they go away from areas where there is not enough water for them to sustain them and that is really important and that you see almost everywhere throughout the range but uh, this is in the case of rivers canals are quite different when compared to rivers canals are linear they don't have uh, changes in uh, they don't have complications like changes in depth they don't have meanders they don't have bends it's a very simple linear structure uh, which does not have changes in depth but one the catch here is that since canals are very narrow they are they can maintain the water level all throughout from the winter to the summer season so the water level does not dip a lot of canals so is that a good thing for the dolphins if good if it is then how exactly so to answer this question i went to farakka which was my study site uh, for my dissertation and uh, you need not focus on all the colors here i'll just be talking about the canal which is shown in green here my cursor is there and as you can see it's a very thin structure compared to the river and it does not have bends and meanders like you see in the lower ugly river linear thin narrow and it originates from the farakka barrage the farakka barrage was completed in 1975 and the sole purpose of it was to divert water from this ganga river into the hugli river because uh, the so that the kolkata port and other areas above it could remain navigable for uh, ships and other modes of transportation so i went there and my purpose was to see that how the importance of this canal for dolphins changes from winter to summer when water levels are actually quite low in the real river so what to understand what that what i did was i conducted boat surveys along the river i had a boat and i went downstream which means along the flow of the river and wherever i saw a dolphin i noted its location i noted how many dolphins i saw how many fishing boats i saw and other variables that are not particularly relevant here and what i found was really quite interesting because uh when you uh, look at num- dolphin numbers in the canal in december they are quite low which is understandable they occur in very low densities all throughout the range you have two four around maybe 10 dolphins in winter but as the summer approaches as you move towards march when water really starts to decrease in other areas there's enough wa- the water level in the feeder canal remains the same 
and that time you have almost 10 times more dolphins, eight to 10 times more dolphins. You have 60 dolphins in a linear stretch that is barely 38 kilometers long. And this is incredible because such dolphin densities have never been recorded anywhere throughout the range. And it seems like uh, the canal acts as a very important habitat for them, especially in the summer season. But there's a catch and that is that with increasing, uh, with the progress of summer, you also have a greater increase, uh, greater number of fishing vessels in the canal. So which means that there are more nets deployed to catch fish in the canal. Now to understand the gravity of this, you must think that you must understand that the canal is just 180 to 200 meters wide and the nets that the fishermen deploy are about 100 to 120 meters in length. So when they deploy a net vertically, if this is the river flowing and they deploy the net vertically, it becomes a barricade, sort of a barricade for the dolphin. And you have tens and tens and tens of those nets deployed all over the canal. So what essentially what you have is a greater overlap of dolphins and fishing nets, which means that the animals are more likely to get caught in nets and then eventually die. And this is uh, really uh, what the figures that I learned from the from my field were quite astonishing because people they told me that around eight to ten dolphins die every year in the canal. Now I don't know how scientific or uh, how real that is, but that is what I have heard through my experiences. Uh, but eight to ten dolphins may not sound much, but it is quite a lot considering that each of uh, these species have just one calf in one year. Eight to ten dolphins moving out every year in just a stretch of 40 kilometers is quite a lot. Uh, but and working in such artificial and semi-urban habitats, of course, poses a lot of challenges. The importance of canals from my study, it is evident that canals are really important, uh, especially in a dry season when water levels actually start to recede. And the results obviously indicate that to save species, to conserve the river dolphins, you need to regulate the fisheries, the intensity of fisheries somehow. But <laughs> these areas are not protected. They are open access to all. Any, if anyone can go there with a boat and start fishing. So in such a wild kind of area, how exactly are you going to do that when a lot of fishers depend on the fish that they catch for their daily livelihoods, uh, for sustaining themselves? And even if you somehow manage to uh, get a control over all these activities and regulate fisheries in the river, how much are you going to regulate? Uh, typically in research, the answer of how much is answer is pro we answer these how much questions by doing controlled experiments in areas so that we can understand the effects of certain things like how much of fishing intensity is okay for the dolphins. But that cannot be done uh, in a semi-urban area such as Farakka because it is not protected and you don't have that level of uh, control over the dynamics of that area. And above all that a uh, problem that is very specific to rivers is that rivers are habitats that are longitudinally connected, which means that it is the same river that is flowing through Kanpur, through Patna, to then over all the way to Bhagalpur, Kolkata, and then to the sea. So if something hap is happening, say in Patna, if there's a huge deposition of um, pollution and such things, that it is going to affect how things uh, turn out in Kolkata or Bhagalpur or uh, close by areas. But there are challenges, yes, working in unprotected areas, but there are a lot of opportunities as well. Working in areas where you don't require, essentially require permits and you are free to move is cheaper. You can employ more and more people there. And it is less challenging, lo less challenging logistically. You, uh, you can manage a lot more. You are free to go wherever you want and more or less do whatever you want, as long as you are not um, implicitly harming the species or the residents living there. And the most important thing that I believe working in an uh, urban or semi-urban area is that you have a lot of people there. And a lot of people means a lot of eyes to look out for things. And if you are uh, wise enough, you can create a network of people who are always there, whose job is to be on the river like fishermen. And they can provide you good data on sightings and what's happening to the dolphins and how many dolphins are getting caught in the nets, which is uh, for, for a researcher that is like, researcher that is like gold. 
uh, tons of data. Uh, and But overall, when you zoom out and you look at the efforts that are happening to understand and um, protect species in urban, semi-urban habitats, it might seem very bleak and hopeless at times. But we must remember that the idea of conservation biology or the idea of using science and research to protect species is a really new idea. It was discussed, discussed by Michael Sule in 1985. And he said that the conservation is actually very complex because it's, it is not just about research on species. It is about understanding the social dynamics, understanding economical dynamics and political dynamics of various systems. And that is why he termed it as a crisis discipline, which means that people knew that they have to save species, but they didn't really know how. And urban ecology or urban wildlife is also very similar to that, especially in India. So all the stories of uh, bleak and hopeless stories that we hear every now and then, uh, we must not be persuaded into uh, pessimism by that. In fact, the field of urban wildlife and urban research is very new and provides tons of opportunities. And we must remain hopeful. We must remain optimistic and curious about all these things. And most importantly, we must believe and engage ourselves in science so that the future of several threatened and engendered species can be secured. And with that note, I'd like to end my presentation here and I'd be happy to receive any questions. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Imran. That was really a very uh, livening experience listening to you. And of course, aquatic ecosystems are so close to urban life. Now, uh, if we get, get on to some questions uh, that have been raised uh, here, uh, so I will place, uh, due to paucity of time, uh, one one question to each of the speakers. And uh, the first goes to uh, Dr. Vyas. That um, some questions has been raised on the uh, like we have the uh, forest uh, forest now as fragmented forest. So here in uh, urban areas also we have pocketed areas which are um, which are teeming with wildlife, birds, uh, some movements of the. Uh, monitor lizards, jackals, et cetera, et cetera. So how do you think as an, since you have served in an administrative position for quite a long time with so flying colors, so how do you think that the citizens of Kolkata can, uh, can connect uh, with the administrative norms and uh, the guidelines for saving these pockets like Rabindra Shorobar, for example, it, is, uh, it uh, has doc documented so many birds and et cetera. So how do you think, what is your advice to the citizens of Kolkata that what they should do and connect and how to connect the administration uh, in order to save these areas? It's a very important question, but uh, I still feel that perhaps I'm not the right person, but still I will answer this. Reason is when we work in the government, in the forest department, I, I will tell the technical position, wildlife is everywhere. Wildlife can be in the house also, wildlife can be in the garden also, wildlife can be in the... So wherever any wildlife is harmed, certainly wildlife being has a jurisdiction to rescue or if somebody is trying to harass, then mm, we'll lodge the case against the persons for harming the wildlife. So that is one part of the jurisdiction. But as I mentioned that they can be anywhere. So, for example, if the wildlife, say, for example, I will say, Ravindra Certainly, they are very good pockets where a lot of birds and a lot of other wildlife exist. But their overall jurisdiction of their position, so ownership and others, they are with the KMDA and the other agencies. And most of the restrictions, they come from the ECB, Pollution Control Board. Even the NGT, this, uh, when they issue restriction, restrictions and they pass the orders, they order the PCB as well as the owners, that is the KMDA and the other authorities. So from that point, Forest Department has not been a active player in these type of areas. But as I mentioned, wherever any harm is going on, if somebody is trying to catch a bird or somebody is trying to do this thing, 
if anybody approach or if uh, no even if no one approach but information is there action can always be initiated now i come to the part what can be done say those agencies who deal with various human needs so they try to keep the balance which if i am a wildlife our lover i might feel ki justice is not being done to wildlife and unfortunately wildlife do not have the voice so certainly you can be the voice when you have the voice you become the voice of the wildlife some people have reached to the ngt so i think these are the perfect way to become uh, to conserve these areas that you be the voice of the wildlife the moment you stop and uh, do not uh, raise voice for the wildlife in these areas human voices you want to use these areas for various purpose it can be a this festival it can be some religious programs or it can be any other these things there will be no one speaking for the wildlife so what i say in short raise the voice for the conservation of these areas some second thing is you must aware everyone should make try to make aware the authorities because when the pressure comes and every person is vote we live in the democracy and it's a good system best system in the world but in democracy all those who depend on the votes very rightly nothing wrong in that they have to take care of everyone so when some group preaches to them so you have to we have to make i will not say you as i will say we we have to make our this efforts to educate these policy makers decision makers and those who are the owner of these properties that if we this these things are done then in this way wildlife especially birds and others they may leave the area and try to go to some other areas because they may not tolerate the disturbances which are, which is going on and of course in spite of these if some direct attack is there on the wildlife forest department is there they can always pre somebody is try to go uh, this uh, try to capture some birds or try to har har harass any bird or try to this any wildlife then without any hesitation this is 100% jurisdiction of the wildlife wing to go there arrest those persons and book and i must say the the provisions of wildlife protection act they are very harsh they allow arrest of the persons even without warrant and uh, imprisonment may go even up to 6 years uh, so without so these are the in short thank you okay thank you so much sir uh, yes we have to be vigilant enough to save our wildlife now my next question goes to our next speaker mr vishwajit rai choudhury as you said sir that you were part of some housing uh, designs and committee so there a question has come that uh, uh, our housing land development systems are they totally unaware of how to include wildlife in the sector and if so then how can we really change the situation see in fact uh... when you when you see the uh, brochure or their powerpoints what they are going to do uh, how how they are going to develop the property you will find plenty of green as i told uh, plenty of greeneries plenty of fruit orchards and other things but what we find most in most of the cases the uh, developers uh, they don't look after all these things uh, they they mostly give importance to how much uh, uh, how the swimming pool will be made how the playground will be made how the gymnasium will be made and not uh, they don't keep any space for wildlife there so most of the cases but in some cases i have seen the promoters they they uh, consider that and some portion of wetland is maintained some orchards uh, are maintained but there is very very few uh, 
the all renowned uh, i will say all renowned pro uh, these developers i have seen uh, they they don't bother for uh, environment and they they don't have any environment environment consultant or wildlife consultant uh, in their team uh, who will guide all these things so this is very unfortunate uh, in our part thank you sir so we find that uh, in the housing committee again uh, the same question is coming that we have to raise the voice and uh, a positioning of an wildlife consultant beyond environment consultant may be a necessity and we have to think about that in near futures because these promoting are all happening the, destroying the old buildings that we have had lot of civet cats lot of uh, these wild animals uh, and the birds uh, reside in so this this is really a challenge and we may have, we may take up this in a and all the architects planners who are uh, there all all have to be sensitive about it in order to make things happen really so thank you sir and my next question goes to our next speaker mr shomna chatterjee like you have said sir that uh, as a custodian of all the rescue teams and all the trade illegal trade seizures that is happening what is the call that you want to give you have said in the last slide that uh, to call the forest department and awareness etc but uh, to the coming generation i would say uh, what is your call that uh, the kolkata uh, in, i know it's a very uh, uh, strategically placed as the connecting or many transboundary um, areas so what is your concrete uh, suggestion to the citizens of kolkata on being vigilant yes <clears throat> that i have told you uh, told in my presentation also uh, that uh, we are living with such precious uh, neighbors with us the civets the jackals the different types of snakes all are uh, harmless all are neighbors as uh, dr bhaskar has said that all of them are equally uh, important and all of them are hopeless and until they are harm. so uh, and we have to remember that if we don't harm them they will not harm us their only concern is their food and their uh, breeding so if we don't disturb them they will not disturb us in some cases uh, the civets are getting inside the room they are uh, just taking away the fruits etc so if we ourselves can control uh, these things that uh, we keep the uh, fruits or keep the uh, foods away from uh, windows we keep our sur surroundings clean Uh, these are the small things which we can uh, which if we remember we can be a good neighbor and in terms of uh, the trade that uh, that is going on in case of wildlife uh, we have to very much vigilant and uh, we have to see that any wild animal in any number if it is of monkey it is of uh, common langur those cannot be harmed in any way they are, they have the equal right to live in the, uh, this earth as we have so we have to give them equal opportunity to uh, breathe here and we have to be conscious about uh, they are living also both them and us will make a good environment and we have to give our uh, coming generation the opportunity to see that uh, what the precious uh, members of uh, environment we have with us and uh, save them from getting extinct in urban areas thank, thank you thank you so much um, yes uh, we surely i i think whoever listening and we would spread these words and also other uh, stakeholders also have the responsibility to do it and uh, now to imran um, as you talked about the science and research uh, the importance of citizen science how do you think you would connect how what is the call that you would you would give to the researchers to connect it to conservation because as you said that's a, a completely different discipline than doing research and science thanks sachin tadi for that question uh, yes it is a rather new discipline but i believe that research and conservation are not are, are the two sides of the same coin i'd say because 
you need to protect species in order to understand more about them and you need to understand those species more in order to protect them conservation and uh, research are both linked in that way and i believe that uh, conservation is something uh, that that comes to people naturally because people are empathetic uh, towards animals and if we can somehow tap into that potential and inform people uh, using research and the outcomes of research uh, it will be it can create a very potent and powerful outcome because right now research researchers are quite uh, separate from uh, the common people what people what researchers do is not translated and uh, given out for people to understand and i think that is one area where researchers should fo focus uh, in social in uh, science communication which is an emerging field which means just you try to contribute to the larger knowledge body of the society by explaining your work as much as you can in as simple terms as you can to people who may not be completely directly related to you and maybe in a way the talk that i gave today uh, is an effort to that and i know pe many people who are doing this and i hope they'll keep doing this and change the face of conservation and uh, knowledge regarding conservation and species in the near future okay thank you so much so we are in the end uh, as a part of the session and i would like to thank all the panelists uh, all the speakers once again and the participants who have joined we have uh, made it in a very short notice and that uh, the speakers could make it today and i would like to end the session with the call from dr vyas as he said that uh, let us all be the voice for wildlife thank you so much Thank you.